Al Jazeera podcast. It is around 8 or 9 p.m. on Tuesday night. There's a thousand people, members of Iraq's Syrian community, flock to the wedding hall to celebrate the marriage of a newlywed couple, Hanin, the bride, and uh, Rivan, the groom, in uh, Nainawa province's Hamdania district. Julian Bichucha is a reporter for Rudal, a leading media network in northern Iraq. Like the couple getting married on Tuesday, Julian is part of a minority community. There would be a cold meza served, so stuff like hummus, like salads. There would be cake and soda for the kids. And people would be like getting up and down, dancing and stuff. And then after the initial dancing, it is time for the couple, the newlyweds. The bride and groom were just starting their first dance. It was a moment to celebrate. And uh, as they get up and start slow dancing, fireworks are lit from the floor, which project towards the ceiling. When the sparks hit the ceiling, the plastic, cheap, illegal material that the ceiling was built out of immediately caught on fire. Entire ceiling catches on fire in mere moments. The fire spreads so fast, it's almost unbelievable. Witnesses from inside the hall that managed to escape say that the entire ceiling was in flames. Pieces of fire were raining down on the people within mere seconds of the fireworks being lit. At least 100 people have died. Many more have been injured after fire broke out at a wedding in northern Iraq. It happened in a mainly Christian part of Hamdania district in the province of Nineveh. Up to 1,000 people were at the ceremony. Minorities in Iraq, including Christians, face persecution under ISIL. This is a region where people are still returning. Could this latest fire have been prevented? And what does it mean for the community that's only now coming back from years of devastation? I'm Kevin Hurton, in for Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. Alhamdaniya is in the Nineveh government in northern Iraq, in a Christian-majority district. A town that once held the largest Christian population in Iraq. They and the vast majority of the village's Yazidi and Muslim community fled in 2014. So Julian, tell me a little more about your connection to this region. I'm originally from Ankawa, which is a district right north of Erbil city. It is a Christian majority district. I am an Assyrian Christian. I was born and raised here and I've seen many, like I've seen all kinds of conflict in my life. I've been through uh, the US invasion of Iraq in 2003. I also fully experienced the war against the Islamic State when ISIS invaded northern Iraq. It was a a, a terrifying experience, you could call it. Mm. But I am very, very connected to this region. And I'm here in Hamdania on the ground. I'm in the car and I'm talking to you right now, right outside a cemetery where funeral processions are being held for the victims. What's happening now at the scene? Did the bride and groom survive? The bride and groom have fortunately survived, yes. They survived by escaping through the back kitchen door and then they were transported to an Erbil hospital after the Kurdistan region of Iraq's Prime Minister Masrur Barzani sent teams to help out because the hospitals were so overpacked and medical supplies were almost non-existent. Yeah. So the bride and the groom were transported to a hospital in Erbil and there they received treatment and the groom returned to Hamdania to take part in some of the funeral processions of the victims and videos on social media show that he was completely psychologically ruined. I mean, imagine you get married and because of your wedding, more than 100 people are dead. Weddings, especially for the community of Hamdania, which has been devastated by years of war and especially recently devastated by ISIS. Weddings are very important because they signify the start of another life. So when people attend weddings, they get happy, knowing that the culture is being carried on, knowing that the the community, which is dwindling 
has one more chance of actually being revived of you know the members of the community expanding so weddings are very important here to connect families especially yeah in hamdania it's a town where after isis not many people actually returned back to their hometown because of many issues such as uh, the lack of proper security the lack of economic opportunities and just people especially especially assyrian iraqis especially christian iraqis were fed up of the country the country that has persecuted them for so long and a country that fails to protect them over and over again but Despite that, Hamdania was still one of the towns that witnessed the largest amount of people returning, like returning to the town after ISIS was driven out. What happened was an absolute tragedy. It was a tragedy that could have been so easily avoided. Yeah, I can hear it in your voice. I can hear that frustration, that anger, that speaking through you from the people you've been talking to all day. There were absolutely no safety measures. Nothing, absolutely nothing. In fact, many witnesses say that the main door of the party, the main door of the party hall was not even opening from the inside. And they had to bring up, they had to bring a bulldozer to uh, basically tear down a section of the wall so people could escape. The only other exit was the back kitchen door, which is just a small door enough to fit one person at a time. So you could imagine the stampede as a thousand people are trying to escape a building which is about to collapse, and collapse it did. People are angry, they're very, very angry, the Iraqi authorities, and tragedy after tragedy keeps occurring in this country due to the lack of implementing certain measures that honestly are not difficult to implement. I was going to ask you how people are, if people are just completely numb, could just to go from something that's such a celebration for this tightly knit community to this a tragedy that's almost unconscionable. How you even process that? Well, I didn't expect it to actually be this bad when I came today and I I went to the church and as the funeral mass was coming to a close and people were coming out, the families of the victims, it was terrible. You either have people that are absolutely numb and there's, ab- there's no expressions on their faces and then you have people that are full of rage. They're just screaming. It was... It's a scene that I honestly believe that not everybody can handle seeing. Usually funerals are done because one person dies. And I guess you could say that's manageable. But here you have family after family. I spoke with a deacon in the Chaldean church, in the Catholic church in Hamdania, who came out and said that his wife, they had been married uh, for 56 years. He said that his wife that would she died she lost her life in the wedding disaster and he just looked at me and just told me that i have no reason to live anymore that's it the light of my life has extinguished it's it's over for me i don't know how i'm gonna go home today and not be greeted by her smile so it's 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 the worst kind of suffering imaginable After the break, was this fire a direct consequence of Iraq's corruption? And what does it mean for the community that survived it?
So Julian, Alhamdania is a major Christian in a Syrian city in northern Iraq, an area where ISIL took over 10 years ago. At the time, many Christians fled, as you mentioned. Last year, the mayor of Hamdania said that 40% of the district's Christians still have not returned since 2014. What does this mean for the remaining Christian community in this district who have already experienced so much tragedy over the past 10 years? It's like the final nail in the coffin. People came back with a promise from Iraqi authorities, especially the minority Christian community. They came back with a promise from Iraqi authorities that they're going to be taken care of, that they're going to be protected, and that they will no longer see suffering. But what I heard in the church today, what I heard as I'm talking to people is that they are literally saying that what happened is like another ISIS. They, their, their hopes are absolutely shattered because this isn't the first, second, or third time something like this has happened. A tragedy has happened in this country that could have been so easily preventable. So people are done, they're fed up, they, they have no hope anymore, they have no reason to trust the authorities anymore. I genuinely think, I think that people are going to start leaving after this happened because there's just, the idea of what happened goes way further than just a simple wedding. Mm. It goes to show just the sheer incompetence of Iraqi authorities especially after the Iraqi civil defense said that this hall was built illegally and that mat illegal material was used, and I quote, contravened safety standards. Yet this hall was still allowed to operate because allegedly, allegedly, the owner of the hall who was arrested in, the, in Erbil, capital of the Kurdistan region of Iraq, and handed over to the Iraqi interior ministry, kept receiving uh, orders to, you know, either improve the safety standards of his hall or shut it down completely and not host any celebrations. But he kept basically bribing officials to allow him to continue to hold celebrations. And unfortunately, it led to the most destructive aftermath that could have been possibly imagined. As we're speaking right now, the prime minister is visiting. With all of this anger, how is he going to be greeted? The prime minister, he has given strong statements of support to the people of Hamdania. He has said that we will hold those responsible accountable. We'll make sure that things like this don't happen again. But he has just reiterated the same words that previous prime ministers have. Nothing special. They all kept saying the same thing. And unfortunately, tragedy after tragedy keeps unfolding in this country that cannot, that cannot seem to rest from the U.S. invasion to ISIS to tragedies like this. The people of Hamdania... I think they're completely numb and they just, the last thing they want to see, the last people they want to hear from are officials. So there have been several deadly fires in Iraq in recent years. In 2021, there was a similar tragedy at a hospital in Baghdad that killed over 80 people. This was followed by yet another deadly fire at a hospital in the city of Nasiriyah, which killed over 90 people. Now we have this. I mean, what is going on? Why are there so few safety controls with building regulations in Iraq? This is a consequence of extreme corruption and electing officials that are so easily bribed. This is a consequence of electing officials from very large political parties that act with impunity, operate with complete, complete impunity and absolute zero fear of the judicial system. This is a consequence of the judicial system not persecuting those who practice such extreme corruption appropriately. And this is just a consequence of the Iraqi political system as a whole, which since the 2003 invasion has been nothing short of shambles. As someone who has lived in Iraq his entire life, I don't see the situation improving. Unfortunately, throughout the years, uh, many, many different parties have tried to enact change. In 2019, there were massive uh, anti-government protests in Baghdad and the southern provinces of Iraq. They were dubbed the Tishreen Movement. In cities across the country, young and mostly unemployed Iraqis are directing their anger at officialdom. They were basically calling for an end of uh, endemic corruption in Iraq because it truly is endemic. Yeah. And these protests were initially successful. The government caved in. The prime minister at that time, Adil Abdul, Abdul Mahdi, did resign. And the government promised reform. And slight reforms that were carried out have unfortunately been slowly rolled back. 
And the demands of the Tishrini protesters, they call them, the demands of the Tishrini protesters were just completely cast aside, completely uncared for, as soon as the government gained complete control of everything again. So the reality is that the Iraqi politicians have perfected, they have mastered the art of, you know, appeasing people temporarily, making people believe that, okay, no, this time, please give me a chance, I will do better. But then as soon as people do give them a chance, when they see that they're trying to do better, they just revert back to their old ways. For a way forward, I think there has to be, honestly, a complete, complete social and democratic reform in Iraq. The entire government needs to be reformed, like from the, from the top all the way to the bottom, everything. So Julian, there's been this perception, at least maybe a hope in Iraq, in recent years that things have been slowly getting back to normal. And then something like this happens and it leaves people shaken. You've been talking to people at the church in this Christian community who have survived ISIL. I wonder how much does faith factor in here? And maybe not just a faith in God, but also a faith that as a community, they can get through this together. Faith is all that these people have, both faith in God, faith in Jesus Christ, and faith in their strength as a community. The Iraqi Christian community in general, it's... uh, it's quite a religious community, you know, they're very, very, very connected with religion and just they believe that it is the only tool that has kept them survive through years of oppression. Most people cannot recall a time when Iraqi Christians had it good. They can't recall a time when Iraqi Christians simply had it normal, not even, not even good. So it's just now with events like this, it triggers more and more Christians to start rethinking everything again. like. Why am I staying here? What's my purpose? Why should I stay in a country that fails to protect me? A country that has failed me in every single way. A country that persecutes me for my religion. It's, it's, it's tragic as anything. And I, I don't see it recovering anytime soon. But honestly, faith is all these people have. And that's the take. This episode was produced by Faranisa Kampana and Khalid Sultan, with David Enders, Amy Walters, Zaina Badr, Ashish Malhotra, Chloe K. Lee, Miranda Lynn, Sonia Bagat, Sari Al Khalili, and me, Kevin Hurton, in for Malika Bilal. Alex Roldan is our sound designer, Alexander Locke is the Take's executive producer, and Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back. <laughs>